Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. students welcome to swayam prabha channel i am swati solanki working as assistant professor at faculty of law university of delhi i am taking up the course on white collar crimes and in today's session we will be dealing with the prevention of money laundering act 2002 this whole lecture series about prevention of money laundering will be divided into three parts now let's get to the objective of today's lecture first what is the meaning process and punishment for money laundering in order to understand this we first also need to understand the other definitions which will be relevant for the first objective third we will try to understand the process of attachment provided under section 5 of the pmla act 2002 now if we talk about what necessitated to have the prevention of money laundering act it would be correct to say that that in the 90s when the world was grappling with the problem of the illicit trafficking in narcotic and the psychotropic substances the countries around the globe needed to come together and have a policy to tackle with the problem with the proceeds of the crime or the money that was being generated from the illegal trafficking of the drugs and psychotropic substances now it is in this context that the countries started to develop a regime in their respective states wherein they were formulating the law to tackle the problem of the money laundering now in this context india in order to fulfill its obligation implemented the political declaration adopted by the special session of united nations general assembly 1999 which called upon the member states to adopt money laundering legislation and programs this present act became enforceable with the effect from 1st july 2005 now if we look at the objective or the introductory part of the pmla it is three folded first to prevent and control the money laundering second to provide for confiscation of property derived or obtained from money laundering and matters connected therewith now this legislation not only focuses on criminalizing those who have been involved in money laundering but it also focuses on preventing the money laundering right now let's say you have committed some offense and from that offense you have generated some money we must try to trace that trail from where this money has come and try to confiscate those properties so the second objective pertains to confiscation of those properties which have been generated from the offense of money laundering and the matters which are incidental there too in order to understand the process of money laundering it is first important that we refer what is the concept of money laundering money laundering is the process by which large amount of illegally obtained money is given the appearance of having originated from a legitimate source it is legitimization or washing of illegally obtained money to hide its true nature or source the international federation of accountants classifies money laundering activities in three stages that is placement layering and integration simply stating money laundering is the process wherein let's say a scheduled offense has been committed as provided under the pmla for an instance let's talk about kidnapping for ransom a child has been kidnapped and the alleged accused us that in order to release this child i demand 1 crore rupees now a crime has been committed an offense has been committed and the money has been generated from this crime 
Now, what is interesting to note here is that that he needs to bring this money into the legitimate financial system. Obviously, he cannot bring this huge amount at once into the financial system. If he does so, the question will be asked that please reveal the source from where he has derived this money. He is not going to do that. So what he will do, he might break that large amount of money into smaller money, into various transactions to bring it into the financial legitimate system. Now what happens in here that why is he doing so? Because he wants to conceal the original source from where the money has been generated. Now let's say I have I have broken this huge amount of money into hundreds and hundreds of small transactions. Will it now be easier for me to introduce this money into the legitimate financial system? Answer could be probably yes. Now I want to move away farther and farther from the original source of this money. So that stage is called as the layering stage and ultimately I want to bring in this tainted money which is the black money which has come from commission of any crime or an offense into the legitimate financial system. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to make it look like as if it is my legitimate money. So the entire process of from the time when the money has been generated till the time it has been revealed as, as if your it is your original white money, the entire process comes under the concept of money laundering. Now as we have understood that there are three stages in the process of money laundering, let's first have a look at the first stage that is the placement. Now what I'm trying to do in here that I'm trying to introduce this huge amount into the legitimate financial system that is the most difficult part. Now how it is this accomplished? There are various techniques to this. This is accomplished by breaking up the large amounts of cash into smaller sums that are then deposited into a bank account or by purchasing monetary instruments, transferring the cash overseas for deposit in banking financial institution, purchase of high value things such as gold, precious stones, artworks, etc., and reselling them through checks or bank transfer. Now, why do we do this? The aim is to remove the tainted cash from the original source of its acquisition. There are various ways by which one can start this process, which is the placement stage, and first is smurfing. Now, what is smurfing? Let's say I have obtained some black money which is let's say 10 lakh. If I deposit this 10 lakh amount into the bank at once, the bank following the KYC norms would ask you to reveal that from where you have received this amount of 10 lakh. Then you will have to declare that what is the source of this amount. But I do not want to do that. Why? Because it is the black money. So in order to bring this black money into the legitimate financial system, what can I do? Let's say I make the deposits in the names of my friends and family members and the employees. And these employees, friends, families would, let's say, be somewhere around 50 to 100 people. And each one of them are depositing the amount lesser than 50,000 into the bank. Now, when you deposit the less amount into the bank, bank is not going to ask you to reveal the source. So what I have done here, I have broken down this huge amount of monies into small, small transaction so that this financial system does not ask me from where this money has come to you. And this process is called as smurfing. Now look at the shell companies. Sometimes we do come across news like that there is a company which exists only on the paper. Now why am I doing so? 
I am doing it because I have to channelize this black money in the form of, let's say this company is making annual profits to the tune of 1 crore rupees. So I am showing it on the paper that this company exists, whereas in reality, there is no company like that. And why have I done it? Only to channelize my black money to bring it into the legitimate financial system. Now, Clossy, which is another example, it says round tipping. Offshore banks were where minimal records are kept. Now, I may transfer this money which have been originated by the commission of a crime or an offence in the Indian territory. And now, I am siphoning of this money to those countries which are known as tax heaven countries. There are minimal regulation to reveal the actual source of this money. And then I am bringing this money bank through the foreign direct investment. Ultimately, money is going to come to me. But what I have done, I have siphoned of the money to the other states where are no or where are minimal regulations to reveal the actual source of the money. Now, what is the next way? I could invest into real estate. Let's say I had committed an offense wherein I was the public servant and I had taken the undue advantage or we can say I have taken the bribe of 1 crore rupees. In order to bring this black money into the market, I may invest some of this black money in purchasing the real estate. We all know, unfortunately, that when we talk about purchasing of the property, there is a rate that goes in the market that 60% you have to pay in white and 40% you have to pay in black. Now this has also been noted by the Von Chu committee that it is unfortunate that sometimes it is to the extent of 50% white and 50% black. So on the paper you are revealing that this is your property that rightfully belongs to you where you have paid let's say 50 lakh that was your white money but the other 50 lakh had come to you by committing an offence under the Prevention of Corruption Act. So what you are doing, you are spending this money into the real estates wherein you are utilising your black money. Let's say you have purchased two properties, 50 lakh has been per 50 lakh has been spent in buying property A, another 50 has been spent in buying property B. So ultimately what you have done, you have clubbed your black money with the white money, but what will look on the surface as if this property has come to you through legitimate source of income. Next example is of black salaries. Sometimes we come across examples like that the company may reveal in their official records that in this organization there are 200 employees that work but in reality 35 employees existed only on the papers now why do they do this now they have to pay salaries to the employees so for let's say 170 people they were using the white money but for 30 people, they were utilizing their black money. So we do not have any existing real human being, but we have unregistered employees. They do not exist at all. And these are called as black salaries. As we are talking about, you know, what are the various ways of committing or starting the process of money laundering, we must think that what is the consequence of it? One of the consequences and which is the consequence is grave and pervasive is that that bad money drives out good money. Let's say I am a corrupt public servant for an instance and I have entered into an agreement with you that I will give you the tender to construct the highway. 
Now, this person who has applied for the tender says that I will offer you 1 crore rupees if you give me this contract. Now, what has happened? This person who is giving or offering 1 crore rupees, assuming that it is his black money, this person wants to utilize his black money. Now, he is transferring it to another person wherein there is no liability at all. But in the process, who has been deprived of rendering the quality work? Someone who wanted to utilize his legitimate money. So bad people drive out good people and equally bad money drive out good money as well, which causes loss to the exchequer of the state. Now the placement stage is followed by the next stage that is layering. Now let's refer to what does it mean? It refers to the separation of illicit proceeds from their source by creating complex layers of financial transactions. Now how do we understand this? Let's say I had in my first example purchased two properties, property number one and property number two wherein I had divided my black money into two parts, 50 lakh in first, 50 lakh in the second one. Now, after some years, I have sold those properties again and invested into some other way. How these investments can be made? I may buy these shares in a company. I may buy another asset like gold. I may buy artifacts. I may invest into buying the intellectual property rights and so and so forth and this I am doing over years and years. Now what is happening in here? Am I moving away farther and farther from the original source from where the money had come? The answer is yes. So now when the enforcement agencies try to trace the trail from where this money has come it will be very difficult for them to actually do the audit trailing that this was the original source of the money. Now the only intent of doing this stage is that I want to conceal and I want to move farther and farther from the original source of the tainted money. As I have written the aim is layering conceals the audit trail and it provide anonymity. We cannot go back to from where this money had been originated. Now what are the various ways? Wire transfers of fund is one of the easiest way these days wherein I can actually hide the black money. Sometimes front companies are being established to accomplish this task. Now what are these front companies? They try to obscure or hide the real owners. It may be registered in someone else. So what I'm doing that the company actually belongs to me though it registered it is registered in the name of someone else. Just to do this business that I am transferring the money from company B to A or A to B. Right now these companies obscure the real owners of the money through the back through the bank secrecy laws and the attorney client privilege. The techniques used for the purposes are to lend the proceeds back to the owners as loans, gifts and etc. Now why I am doing this here? Because ultimately this money should come to that person who is trying to make it look like as if it is his white money. So we are moving from tainted money towards untainted money. Now it can be done through the way of under invoicing of the items exported to the real owner. In some cases the transfers may be disguised as payments for the goods or services thus giving them a legitimate appearance. Sometimes then there is no service that has been taken but on the paper it shows that for this service you have paid this much. So what you are doing you are converting it converting your black money into the white money. So let's say I have invested into multiple businesses, multiple assets have been created. At some point I would want to collect all those monies and make it look like that it belongs to me because they have now come to me from the legitimate sources. So the next stage is the integration 
it is the final stage in the process it is the stage at which money is integrated into the legitimate economic and financial system and it is assimilated with all other assets in the system integration of the clean money into the economy is accomplished by the launderer making it appear to have been legally earned now what is happening here in my previous example when i had said i had purchased two properties i then invested into multiple businesses created assets now i have sold everything why because now it will look like that you have sold these assets or properties legitimately and now you are investing into buying into let's say one big piece of land and that is how you have collected all those black monies which will now look like as if it's your white money now it ends with it involves the moment of layered funds which are no longer traceable to the criminal origin into the financial world where they are mixed with the funds of the legitimate origin so now what is happening let's say i have bought one piece of land and in between there were 10 other transaction at this stage it is very difficult for us to say that what asset is your legitimate and what asset is coming from the illegitimate money so it has been intertwined and the nature of the transaction is so complex that you cannot bifurcate that what is your white money and what is your black money now what is the aim for doing so to create an apparent legal origin and use those proceeds for personal benefit this is again achieved by creating the front companies the money may be invested in real estates business etc by this stage it is exceedingly difficult to distinguish between legal and illegal wealth now after having understood that what is the process of money laundering and what are the stages are involved in that it is a good time to have a look at the definitions under the act of 2002 Section 2P says money laundering has the meaning assigned to it in section 3 we will get there in some time but before that it is important for us to understand the meaning of the schedule offense section 2Y talks about schedule offense means the offenses specified under part A of the schedule The offences specified under Part B of the schedule, if the total value involved in such offences is one crore rupees or more, the offences specified under Part C of the schedule. So, if you have a look at the Bear Act, in this schedule, various legislations have been provided, starting from your principal code, that is the IPC. narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances act immoral trafficking prevention act then you have the prevention of corruption act the wildlife act so on and so forth so let's say for an instance when we talk about globally what are the three transnational crimes the top 3 are trafficking in person trafficking in drugs and psychotropic substances and trafficking in arms and ammunition so what happens when someone has been trafficked from country a to b obviously there are a lot of people involved in there each one of them have taken money now this money has come to them by committing an offense right and let's say now these people want to bring this money into the financial legitimate system therefore the proceeds of crime have been defined under the part a of the schedule then when we talk about the other aspect part b and part c are also relevant you will see then that proceed of crime is defined under section 2 clause eu we are going to break down the ingredients of it any property derived or obtained directly or indirectly by any person as a result of criminal activity relating to a scheduled offense that is the first limb of this definition then or the value of any such property this will be the second so let's mark second here 
or where such property is taken or held outside the country. Then the property equivalent in value held within the country. So for your understanding, let us move to the next slide. The property can be derived or obtained directly or indirectly as a result of the criminal activity. No difficulty lies here. I have committed the offence under Prevention of Corruption Act. I have taken the undue advantage of 1 lakh and I am now concealing the true source of it. And with concealment, I was also trying to project it as if it was my white money or I was claiming it to be my white money. So this whole amount is going to be labelled as the proceed of crime. From where it is coming? It is coming from the scheduled offence which is defined under the part A of the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Second is the value of property as I said previously that sometimes it will be difficult for the enforcement agency to trace that what is the actual source from where this person has generated the money. Because the transactions, the nature of the transactions is so complex that it becomes difficult to bifurcate between the white or the black money what the enforcement agency will do in case no property can be traced. Any other property of this person of the equal value can be attached. Sometimes we see that the offence that is the scheduled offence has been committed in, in India but the money has been siphoned off to another state or another state meaning another country or let's say the property has been purchased in another country. Now because of technical glitches as the statutory requirements are there in place, the enforcement directorate finds it difficult to get to that property. What will be done? Let's say if this alleged accused is holding some property within India. If we look at the last part, that is the third part, property has been taken or held abroad any other property. So any other property of equivalent value located in India can be attached by the enforcement directorate. Now when we talk about what is the value of such property or equivalent in value, there has to be some basis. So let us have a look. Basis for this has been that since the actual properties derived or obtained from criminal activity are not traceable or are not available for attachment, the enforcement directorate which is the enforcement agency in our case has the power to attach any other property by relying upon the words value of any such property. In the recent times, Omar Abdullah's ancestral property was attached because the enforcement directorate could not trace that where the money has been utilized or where the money has been invested into the properties. So the ancestral bungalow was attached in this Jammu and Kashmir Cricket Association case. Now when we talk about property, we need to understand the meaning of it and the same has been provided section 2 subsection 1 clause 5. Property means as any property or asset of every description, whether corporeal or incorporeal, movable or immovable, tangible or intangible and includes deeds and instruments evidencing title to or interest in such property or asset wherever located. So when we talk about wherever located, chances are the assets may be located outside the Indian jurisdiction. Now what is important to note here because we are looking at the legal words or terms here, what do we mean by corporeal or incorporeal property? Corporeal property means something tangible that can be seen and touched that exists in real time and space, physical space. And when we talk about incorporeal property, let's say when we look at intellectual property rights, it is an intangible rights but you are entitled to it. So what kind of property is that? It is your incorporeal property. Explanation would then say the term property includes the property of any kind used in the commission of an offence under this act or any of the scheduled offences. So 
what we are trying to imply here that this property is to be used in the widest sense possible. It could take any form or it could take any kind. Now let's say I had purchased uh, the property on uh, 1st March 2010, right? And I had invested the black money into purchasing of that property. Now after 10 years, I had to, because then enter into another stage of the process of money laundering, that is layering and integration, I have sold off this property multiple times. Now how does the enforcement agency decide that how much value is to be attached? So the enforcement agency can say that, okay, this is the audit trail that we have done. And this is the first time that you had bought the first property. This was the fair market value of the said property in question, ED will attach that much value. That has been defined under section 2, subsection 1, clause ZB. Value means the fair market value of any property on the date of its acquisition by any person or if such date cannot be determined, the date on which the said, the date on which such property is possessed by such person. So there may be a chance that we cannot find out that on which date this property was bought. So when the ED is making the investigation, the date on which this property is found to be in possession, the ED will calculate the value accordingly. Now, when we are saying that the one of the objective of the act as discussed in the introduction of the PMLA Act, is to also confiscate those properties. Now, why is it important? Because it has come from the commission of any offense. We want this property to be attached, to be utilized at the time when this person is tried for the offense of money laundering. So who will attach this property and how they will attach this property? So we have two authorities in place. One is the Enforcement Directorate, who is the investigating agency under the purview of the Money Laundering Act. And the other authority, which is an adjudication authority, they then need to confirm that whatever Enforcement Directorate has attached, it is a valid attachment. So we are looking on the civil proceeding that is to be done by adjudicating authority. So where the enforcement directorate officials have been decided, one may refer to section 48 of the act and for adjudicating authority, one may refer to section 6 of the act to be discussed in the part 2 of the lectures. Now the attachment means that uh, under section 2 subsection 1 clause D, the prohibition of transfer, conversion, disposition or movement of the property by an order issued under chapter 3rd. Now we want to protect that property. The person does not temper with the evidences. The person does not transfer the property, right? Then we would be harassing a third person here. He will try his very best to do that. So once the enforcement agency attaches anything, it would automatically be putting prohibition in place that you cannot transfer it, that you cannot convert it, that you cannot dispose it off in any manner whatsoever. So the intent behind this is that to maintain the status quo of those proceeds of crime, those properties which have been traced by the enforcement agency. Now, when we look at transfer, what is the meaning of the transfer? One may refer to clause, one may refer to subclause ZA. Transfer includes sale, purchase, mortgage, pledge, gift, loan, or any other form or transfer of right, title, possession, or lien. So what we are trying to understand here that there is absolute prohibition on transferring the property in any of these forms. Now, before we go to the next part of the session, it is very important to have the overview how this legislation works. And for that, it is first important to understand this flowchart that I have created here. Let's say a scheduled offense has been committed. Let's say you have committed fraud, you have 
taken bribe you have committed tax crimes tax fraud or corruption etc now these are the offenses which have been defined as the scheduled offense by committing these offenses you have now generated money what is this money this is your black money now imagine that this offender is been investigated if we talk about your ipc offenses the police officials can investigate under crpc if we talk about prevention of corruption act we had seen previously that they are to be investigated into the authorized police officials if we talk about the offenses of let's say uh tax frauds that we have agencies in place let's say they are doing the routine investigation against a potential offender under the pmla act they realize at some point that there is a suspicion that this person is also trying to conceal the original source and he is trying to use it possess it you know acquire it or project it to be untainted or claim it to be untainted this is realized while the investigation is been carried on under the scheduled offense now let's say they have filed the charge sheet or they have filed the complaint before the respective court and the court has taken the cognizance against this person now we are here the scheduled offense has been committed the investigation is been done by the relevant authorized enforcement agency which can range from police cbi ncb forest department etc and charge sheet or complaint has been filed to the court now this charge sheet or complaint has been filed for the commission of the scheduled offense we are not talking about the offense of money laundering yet what we are referring to only to the scheduled offense and there is a suspicion after filing the charge sheet or before filing the charge sheet that this person might be involved in the process of money laundering as well there is a suspicion here we do not know whether it is for sure but there are prima facie evidences available that this suspicion arises now the matter will be referred to the enforcement agency for investigation under the pmla act so when we talk about the enforcement agency under the pmla act they cannot investigate the scheduled offense they do not have that power who is authorized or who is empowered to investigate into the scheduled offense only the authorized agency respectively as per the relevant statute or the legislation ed is only empowered to investigate into the offense of money laundering whether the person has tried to conceal the original source whether he has already reached to the stage of claiming it to be untainted from that concealment to the stage of projection or claiming to be untainted everything is included in between and ed is empowered to investigate into that now when the ed is investigating into it let's say they have traced one property which has been purchased using the ill gotten money they want to protect the status quo of this property so what will they do they will provisionally attach the property now this provisional attachment of the property is done under section 5 we will be focusing on this this provisional attachment of the property is done under section 5 now after the provisional attachment has been made the attachment order has to be forwarded to the adjudicating authority whether the attachment has been done properly or not that is to be decided by the adjudicating authority now those proceedings are the civil proceedings let's say the adjudicating authority after hearing both the sides the enforcement directorate and the accused in the question whose property has been att attached finds that the attachment is valid right they will confirm this provisional attachment by passing of the 
confirmation of provisional attachment so this order is commonly called as confirmation attachment order now we are not saying that it has been proved that he has in fact been involved in the offense of money laundering it is only to maintain the status quo because you cannot deprive someone of his right to hold the property and if you are doing so it has to be done by following the due process right so what is the due process that is that you need to follow the process prescribed under the relevant provisions of the pmla that is section 5 and section 8 so at this stage right let's say adjudicating authority has confirmed the provisional attachment this attachment order will remain valid for a period as prescribed under section 8 and during this period the investigating agency that is the enforcement directorate has to file a complaint complaint regarding what complaint regarding the offense of money laundering before the special court special courts have been defined where under section 43 after this process the complaint is been filed to the special court now at this stage what is happening here that there was a case of scheduled offense and now we have a case of offense under the prevention of money laundering act now you have two offenses same person is been tried for two different offenses and these two different offenses will be separate trials now it will be impracticable that the scheduled offense has been tried in some different court let's say court a and court b is hearing the offense of money laundering so what can happen or what can be done in here that the court which was hearing the scheduled offense can commit the case which case the scheduled offense case they can commit the scheduled offense case to this special court who is going to conduct the trial for the offense of prevention of money laundering now in this case let's say the person has been found guilty for the scheduled offense and he has been convicted for the scheduled offense that trial has been concluded now court will see simultaneously they will happen it's we are not waiting that first conviction will happen in the scheduled offense and then only the trial court will look into the trial of the money laundering no let's say the conviction has happened in this offense and court finds that there are evidences he has been involved directly indirectly in the process of money laundering which results into the conviction of this offender even under the money laundering case now what will happen it is now been established that this property has come from the proceeds of crime why because the conviction under scheduled offense has already taken place it is only then that the property will be confiscated the property will be confiscated by passing of the order by the confiscation of tainted money will only happen when the trial court that is the special court passes the order of conviction even under the money laundering act so let's say this person has also been convicted under the money laundering act and the property stands confiscated meaning this person has no right to this property anymore and government wants to take over this property in whose name the property will stand transferred so we have provision under the bmla act which we will be taking into the second discussion that is the part 2 discussion that the property stands confiscated in the name of the central government under section 9 so this is the overview how this act operates in order to take the discussion forward we now must refer to the offense part that is section 3 the offense of money laundering whoever directly or indirectly attempts to indulge or knowingly assist or knowingly is a party or is actually involved in any process 
or activity connected with the proceeds of crime including its concealment, possession, acquisition or use and projecting or claiming it as untainted property shall be guilty of the offence of money laundering. We will first discuss this operating part of the provision. Now you can see I have put one asterisk mark that is the amendment which was done in the year 2013 wherein it was said that the proceeds of crime would also include its concealment, possession, acquisition or use and projecting or claiming it to be untainted. Now when we talk about the ingredients, let us say I have generated the proceeds of crime now, I am trying to either, I am using the word either, I am trying to conceal it, I am trying to have the possession of it. So, I am retaining the possession, I am exercising the control over this property. I have acquired this property, so there is acquisition third or I have been using this property. Now, along with these four ingredients, right, what was the necessary? indispensable condition for the person to be prosecuted under PMLA Act was that along with either of these four things that are concealment, possession, acquisition or use, the person must also be projecting it to be untainted or claiming it to be untainted property. So, when we look at the word and, either these four plus together with two conditions either projection or claiming. So, this word and is to be understood as that it has been used in conjunction not as disjunctive. But what was happened the experience of the investigating agencies and the courts were that lot of people were getting away with the money laundering offence because prosecution was failing to prove that they were claiming or projecting it to be untainted. So, if these two necessary ingredients were missing, they would not be prosecuted or it will not lead into the conviction under the relevant provision that is section 3. So, India you know has tried to keep up the pace as the developments have been made in the other part of the world and following the international obligation in its mutual evaluation report in the year 2010 before the financial action task force it was realized that the cases are being filed right the cases are being investigated but it will not lead into conviction for the simple reason that Indian legislation did not criminalize concealment, possession, acquisition or use as a standalone offence, right? So, pursuant to this, what was done in the year 2019, one explanation was added to section 3 by the way of Finance Amendment Act. And now the explanation is important for us to refer. For the removal of doubts, it is hereby clarified that if a person shall be guilty of offence of money laundering, if such person is found to have directly or indirectly attempted to indulge or knowingly assisted or knowingly is a party or is actually involved in one or more of the following processes. Now once again, we go back to the operating part of the provision which is wide in itself. It says any process or activity. So, it could be anything. What process? The process inclusive of the three layers that we had referred to. What is the placement? Second is the layering and third is the integration. Now, as it is, it was very wide. But how do we interpret it? Because the necessary condition was ki you have to projected it to be untainted or claim it to be untainted, right? So, in this sense, what has been done that now any of these four 
when you are not even trying to project it to be untainted or you are not even claiming it to be untainted let's say you are at the first stage that is the concealment the concealment in itself will now constitute the offense of money laundering and this has been done how by the way of adding the explanation that this word and is to be read as or now it is contentious here we have criminalized something new and it is not by the ordinary way of passing the amendment bill but we have done it through the way of finance amendment act wherein no discussion was done now it was done one view is that that they have done it in regard to the objective of the act that it not only criminalizes the offense of money laundering but it also aims at the prevention and it tries to control the money laundering process as well so if we follow that view it seems to be valid but what is the flip side of it that we now have made the concealment in itself as a stand alone offense of the money laundering what has been noticed that in order to harass people the allegation is that the enforcement directorate is misusing this law right and this is the tactic that have been used to harass the people so what has been done further that when we look at uh, let's say the offense of money laundering whether it is a single act or it is a series of acts if we have understood the concept we may realize by now that it is a continuous act then it has been clarified under sub clause 2 it says the process or activity connected with the proceeds of crime is a continuing activity and continues till such time a person is directly or indirectly enjoying the proceeds of crime by its concealment or possession or acquisition or use or projecting it as untainted property or claiming it as untainted property in any manner whatsoever now this pmla act came into enforcement with the effect from 2005 imagine that i had committed the scheduled offense in some year 1999 and with that money i have purchased the property in the year 2000 at that point of time we did not have prevention of money laundering but whether i am continuing to be in possession of that proceeds of crime the answer is yes so what is important to note here is that that at that date when i purchased the property in the year 2000 on that date we did not have the offense of prevention of money laundering act why because it only came into enforcement from 2005 so one could argue that the day when i had purchased this property there was no offense of money laundering so i cannot be prosecuted under the relevant act but court now have clarified through the judicial pronouncement that in that sense lot of people would be escaping the prosecution under the money laundering and with these experiences the amendment was done that it is not a single act it is a continuing activity and in order to tap those people in order to trap these people it must be clarified with the help of the explanation so when we look at the penalty aspect of it section 4 talks about the punishment for money laundering whoever commits the offense of money laundering whoever commits the offense of money laundering shall be punishable with rigorous imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than 3 years but which may extend to 7 years and shall also be liable to fine so the penalty is of the minimum is 3 years and the maximum is of 7 years another important thing to be noted in here is that that when we are referring to the scheduled offense paragraph 2 of part a of the schedule the punishment has been enhanced now we must understand what does para 2 deals with 
in the beginning we started with this uh, proposition that uh, the world was dealing with the menace of proceeds which were generated from trafficking in drugs and psychotropic substances this is one of the way where lot of money black money were transferred across the border therefore it requires stringent provisions to tackle with the menace of drug trafficking so whenever we talk about let's say the scheduled offense falls under the paragraph 2 which deals with the ndps act the person will be given the enhanced sentence even for the offense of money laundering and now let's read it provided that where the proceeds of crime involved in money laundering relates to any offense specified under paragraph 2 of part a of the schedule the provisions of this section shall have effect as if for the words which may extend to 7 years or the words which may extend to 10 years now the minimum is 7 years and the maximum is of 10 years so today we have tried to understand uh, that what are the different definitions under the pmla act and we have briefly talked about the offense of the money laundering in the next session we will be talking about that what has been the effect of this amendment of 2019 and why india had to make amendments within its legal framework so i hope that you have followed whatever we discussed today thank you Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. Perhaps the most popular literary genre after novel is the short story. Sharp, compact narratives whose charm lies not only in what is said but also in what remains unsaid. Today I'll be reading one of the shortest instances of a short story that I have ever encountered and indeed the very charm of this particular story that i'm going to read out today lies in the way it abruptly ends it is an ancient tale from mesopotamia which has been retold by several authors among whom the name of somerset mom stands out uh, the adaptation that i'll be reading out is perhaps the closest to the one that mom wrote The story is titled in all of its adaptations almost as Appointment in Samara. Here is the story. A merchant in Baghdad once sent one of his servants to the market. The servant was supposed to buy provisions for the merchant, but when he returned, he came back empty-handed. Indeed the servant had all gone white and trembling with fear he told his master that he had met death in the marketplace When I entered the market the servant said to his master I was jostled by a woman and when I turned to look at her I saw that she was death I am very scared master because death looked at me with a threatening gesture Can you please lend me your horse so that I can fly away from Baghdad to the town of Samarra and thereby escape death The master being a good man gave his servant his best horse and saw him gallop off to Samarra to escape death 
Then the master himself went to the marketplace and confronted death. Why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant? Asked the master to death. And death replied, it was not a threatening gesture. Rather, it was a start of surprise. I was astonished to see your servant here today because this evening I have an appointment with him in Samara. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippet.